Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So thankful for the opportunity you've given us to just study together, to fellowship together. We long to be with you and we long to grow in grace and knowledge of Christ. I just ask that you would filter out all of that which is foolish, but just seal to our hearts only truth, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We're going to continue on in our study in Philippians, uh, verse by verse. We're in chapter 2. We're, uh, we're kind of stuck right now over the passage of uh, working out our salvation with fear and trembling, for it's God which worketh in you both to will and do of his good pleasure. And I, I, as I pointed out in my previous video, what appears to be a, uh, a terrifying verse, a verse of discomfort uh, and uncertainty is in fact a verse of comfort, great comfort. I want to talk, spend some time, I think it's important that we look at, at this uh, phrase, fear and trembling. I'm convinced that, that none of us, and I, and I have to include myself here, have, have spent uh, enough time looking at just those two words, fear and trembling, in the context uh, of what we're looking at here in Philippians. Fear and trembling. I mean, let's, let's stop and think for a moment. Just, just let's be honest with ourselves. How many of us have really looked at what it means to, what that verse, uh, looked into what that verse might be talking about? Fear and trembling. Well, I mean, you know, we can, uh, we can just make assumptions. We can say, well, we know what fear means and we know what trembling means, but, but what does it mean in, in this biblical context here? The word fear here in the in the text in our present study the the word in the Greek is phobos. Uh, it means to to withdraw or separate, uh, uh, or flee. Okay, remove yourself uh, from something uh, where that you avoid uh, 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 those feelings of of dread or or fright. It, the word in the Greek is, is often used of, of, it's used negatively of withdrawing from the Lord and His will. It is, that is true. And uh, trembling, traumas, uh, the word tremble, uh, it's where we get, uh, in the Greek, the word tr traumas, it's where we get our word tremor. Uh, it's actually used to describe the anxiety of, of a person who distrusts his ability. That's interesting. And as I pointed out, it doesn't say for it's God which would like to work in you both the will and do of his good pleasure. If only you'd let him. You know, it is, uh, it is you all plural uh, in the context. Of course, we know he's writing to the church at Philippi. So it's all inclusive. Uh, it's not just that he's working in some believers' lives this way uh, according to his good will and pleasure. But in all. And it's, so it's not only all inclusive. But it's it's all encompassing. It's it's when did he be? The question is when uh, you might ask. You know when did God begin that work of of working in you both the will and do of His good pleasure? And most I think would would probably uh, suggest that that began when we became a Christian or when we became born again. Uh, I don't see that in the text at all. We were chosen in Christ from. Uh, the found before the foundation of the world. Uh, so and it it did not begin when we did something. Uh, wasn't something that we did. Uh, scripture makes it clear that that this is a work of God. It wasn't. Con it didn't. Con it wasn't contingent upon, or it didn't depend upon our having done anything. Uh, and our knowing His will, and and His work which is what we see in the verse in our lives is, is really only realized through uh, at what we're doing here now. And that's the study of his word. And we're commanded to study, to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. If you remember back in our study in Ephesians, uh, we're, we were, uh, 
the, in the first very first chapter, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. That's purposed as in designed beforehand. That's what the, the word means in the original text there. Determined, designed beforehand. So it, it, it involves belief and trust. Uh, we know that, that uh, from other scripture, uh, and this is what we should be doing, is we, we should be, uh, and this is where I think we many Christians have, have uh, short-circuited their, their walk by not looking at, at all of these other references where that we see the phrase fear and trembling occur in Scripture. Now, I want to look at that. Uh, I did look at that. Uh, I thought that it was worth spending some time on. You know, it just goes without saying, folks. If, if we have a verse here that says for us to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, and then it's, it might help us considerably to look at other verses where we see the phrase fear and trembling and get a feel for what exactly might, it might be, the, just what the, 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 the message that the Holy Spirit is trying to convey here is, you know, is it really one of fright? Like, you know, you're, you're startled by, you're walking in the woods and you're startled by a grizzly bear or brown bear, a big uh, black bear, or, you know, you, you come across a bear and you're, you're, you're frightened. And, uh, you know, it, it, I, I know for myself, if I was walking along in the woods and I didn't have any protection and I was off all by myself and I, and I ran into a bear in the woods, I would probably, I would probably be in fear and trembling. So the question is, is, is that what that means in this verse? That's the question I want to address. And if, and, if, and if it is, then how does that play out in our lives? If it isn't, then we need to understand what it means to work. And you would think that in a context, of, and this, listen to me, dearly beloved, you would think that in a, in a verse in which it says to work out our salvation, uh, we would... Uh, I mean, how could we not look at this as being extremely important as far as our understanding goes? We're, I mean, here, we're only talking about our salvation. We're only, and, and, and I pointed out that's, that doesn't mean redemption. That's salvation in the ongoing sense. And I believe it's salvation from law. It's deliverance. The word is deliverance. It's deliverance from law. You know, we're already His. We already belong to Him. It's, this is not talking about redemption. It's talking about something as important as deliverance from law. Now, it could be, you could, you could say it's deliverance. It's all inclusive. It's, it's all, it's deliverance from all of those things that, that we've died to. You know, uh, we, when we were crucified with Christ, if you look at throughout the New Testament, you'll come up with six things that Scripture says we've died to. We've died to sin, self, the law, the world, Satan, and death. So that deliverance could be could include all of that, but I I'm going to suggest that that uh, because that is a, a major theme throughout all of, every single one of Paul's epistles is is he, where he draws the distinction between law and grace that we're looking at here at, at a deliverance from law. Work out your deliverance from law with fear and trembling. For it's God at work in you both the will and do of his good pleasure. I think we need to, to put before us here on, on, on in, in our study here, highlight the fact that, that we've already seen that Paul said, for to me to live is Christ. Okay. Uh, I want to I want to read some verses here that I believe that will tie in with this. Uh Romans fifteen eighteen. I will not presume to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me in leading the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed. I will not presume to speak of anything except what, what if I stood up in church and said, uh, uh, I will not presume to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me. Now just imagine that. Uh, 
that's not something that Christians are typically are used to hearing. Uh, they, they may be familiar with the verse, but it's, it doesn't seem to fit the narrative of modern Christianity today. Uh, uh, much of what is spoken about is, is not what Christ has accomplished through us, but what we've accomplished for Christ. 2 Corinthians 2.16, but, but by the grace of God I am what I am. Uh, how much has that verse really sunk into our uh, thinking? But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And we're looking at working out our salvation with fear and trembling, for it's, it's God at work in us, both the will and do of His good pleasure. How about uh, 2 Corinthians 12, 9? And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Uh, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Interesting verse. A wonderful verse. Wonderful verse showing that it is Christ in us, not ourselves. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. I mean, listen, dearly beloved, uh, you know, it's, it's just one, I see one verse after another that, that basically, and, and I, this is what I love about this verse, we, that we have this, this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. And that I just, it, how could you not read that and, and just, and be comforted so much by that? Now, there's many other verses I could read. I could go on here with, uh, uh, you know, just the, at Romans 11, near the end of the chapter of Romans 11, for of him and through him and, and to him or are all things to him to whom be glory forever i'm in and that's i mean that's that's pretty all-encompassing we are to approve the things that are excellent says paul okay in this study in the back in the first chapter of philippians in order that we may be sincere and without offense well how many of us have really taken the time to Try to understand what it would mean to be without offense. Uh, most, I think, most Christians today think that well, to be without offense is to is to just to keep the law perfectly, as perfectly as you can. And if you slip up and you don't keep the law exactly the way that you should, then you've you're you are with offense. I'm going to suggest it's just the opposite. Uh, we God has nothing against us, okay? Uh, this is until the day of Christ. And in other words, until the end of the age, without offense. If we're living under the law, we are offending much more than what you think we are, including the person and the work of Jesus Christ, the God of all grace. So to fear or not to fear, uh, you know, that's the question. Kind of, you know, reminds me of, you know, what is it, Shakespeare? To be or not to be? To fear or not to fear? That's, that's, that's the question. Uh, it's interesting. I, I remember back in our study in Revelation, we were looking at the churches at Smyrna where it said, he wrote, fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. The words phobos, fear. The word means fear, folks. We're to, in our present study, we're to work out our salvation with fear. And the word means, phobos means fear. It means fear. I mean, I'm not going to try to make the word phobos mean anything other than what it means. But we don't fear God. Okay? In the sense that we are afraid of God. We're afraid of punishment. We're afraid of what he's going to do with it, do to us if we don't do everything exactly the way that we're supposed to do. 
That's not the God that we serve. So we've got some, some a little bit of work in front of us here. We've got to figure out what is it, why does he use the word fear, phobos, real fear, okay? Same word as when Jesus would, would say to his disciples, fear not, or do not be afraid. Same word, phobos, okay? Why are we told in, in some places to not be afraid? And then in, in, in our study here, we're told to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. I mean, are you, are you, you understand, are you getting where I'm coming from here? I'm trying to, to get you to think about just how we glossed many, many times we gloss over this. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And we gloss over that and, and we just kind of assume, well, we know what that means. And, and we don't, but it's, folks, it's a tragedy not to take and, and look at all these other cross references of in where where we see that phrase appear fear and trembling and get a feel for what it might mean here in our present study that's what i did uh, i'd never done this before uh, uh like most i'd always just assume well fear just means reverence okay it's easy to translate it reverence okay if i run into a bear in the woods i'm not going to show him reverence okay or I'm not going to display reverence in that situation. I'm going to fear. I'm going to be terrified. I'm going to be afraid, especially if I can't run very fast. And, then, you know, they say you're not supposed to run. I would find it hard just standing still. Uh, to me, that would be a terrifying experience to be alone in the, in, in the woods and run into a bear, which, which didn't uh, want me around there. That, that perceived me as a threat. Uh, I, I don't perceive God as a threat in my life. And yet I'm, I'm told to work out my salvation with fear and trembling. We're to fear God. We're to fear God and give glory to Him, okay? According to Revelation chapter 14. We fear God. And again, it's it's easy to just say, well, that just means reverence. Okay? Fear. And we haven't even begun to look really look hard at the word tremor yet. Tremble. Fear and trembling. I had to come to the conclusion, conclusion folks, when I was going through this, I had to come to, to the conclusion that fear was to be interpreted according to the context and in, in in which the word is found. A fear is not a bad thing in and of itself. Okay? Fear is not a bad thing. It depends on how the word is used in relation to a situation. Don't fear God forsaking you. Okay? Because he won't. Do fear when it comes to working out your own salvation. So, what are we to, to be in fear and trembling about here in this present context in verses 12 and 13 it is said that faith and fear uh well in, in verses 12 and 13 which is what we're I'm, i've decided to hover over here for just a little bit uh, the language is quite clear okay we're to work out our salvation with fear and trembling because it is god at work in us both the will and do of his good pleasure now Paul says I was with you and this this was in uh, to the, the church at Corinth the Corinthian church he said I was with you in weakness and that word weakness means infirmity I believe the text is saying and I, I looked at every cross reference to that word weakness the word literally means ill sick okay Paul was sick I believe I, I don't know what he had. I don't know if if Paul had the flu. I don't know what he had, but he, but the text makes it absolutely clear when he says that I was with you in weakness. He was saying that, that I was with you uh, ill. Okay, I was sick. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. Same words that we're seeing here. It's, isn't that interesting? I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. Paul says. Uh, 
in 1 Corinthians 2, 3. So we see Paul before the Corinthians in fear and trembling, only to command the Philippians here in our present study to work out their own salvation with fear and trembling. Uh, in Luke 12, I know this is going back to the Gospels. Uh, Christ hadn't yet died on the cross. We're looking at a pre, pre-Calvary period of, of where the Christ ministry to His own people, the Jews, uh, was concerning the kingdom and the church had not, didn't yet exist. I understand that. But in Luke 12, we read, Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Okay? Fear not, little flock. Okay, that is a clear command not to fear. Okay, he's telling his people Israel, the, the, it, it's pleased the Father to give you the kingdom. Don't be afraid. And yet, we come over to Philippians, and now all of a sudden, we're seeing the word to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. I mean, what is going on here? If you came across that bear in the woods, would you feel fear? Well, of course you would. I, I think you would. Uh, you, sh you should. Does feeling that fear mean that you don't have faith? I, I'm going to suggest it doesn't. Not necessarily. I mean, what about the faithful martyr that experiences fear? Might we even have fear if our plane was going to crash, fall out of the sky? You, you board an airliner and, and you're flying a to toward your destination and all of a sudden you know the you you realize the plane is crashing and, and you're afraid uh, but but could you have faith in God at that point does feeling fear mean that you don't have faith fear is a natural response to danger it's not I don't believe that that is the opposite of faith I mean I have a definite fear of not seeing this message in the proper light, okay? Would you call that a healthy fear? Would you call that a faithless fear? I, I think fear might be accompanied by unbelief. I also believe it might be accompanied by unbelief, obviously. So th this is a very tricky little sort of situation that we're in here. It's, it, it behooves us, folks, to find out what it really means to work out our, something as important as our deliverance from law with fear and trembling. I know that faith, uh, I know that fear can lead to a reaction, you know, of a, it, it, a real or a or, or even a perceived threat, you know, can cause fear. And that fear is, is beneficial. It's beneficial because it typically leads you to get to safety uh, while also trusting God for the outcome. You know, I would run from the bear, but I would also trust God for the outcome. I think, I think that we would do well to not gloss over something as important as working out our own salvation with fear and trembling. Folks, this is the only verse uh, like this, okay? We're, we're, it is specifically said we are to work out our, and this is a command, work out our salvation with fear and trembling uh, because it is God at work in you both the will and do of his good pleasure. And, and so many of us today, I think, don't really understand what fear and trembling is. What does it mean to fear and tremble? I, I decided to devote an entire video to trying to, to, to understand for myself, first and foremost, what does it really mean to fear and tremble? Because I know that it, it, it's, it's, it can't be anything negative, or I didn't think that it was. Uh, Paul's teaching here uh, in particular is a message that stands in opposition to the idea of human merit. I don't know how many times we've seen Paul's epistles scattered throughout. It's like a, a golden thread woven throughout the entire New Testament, actually. 
that our relationship with God, our salvation, our deliverance is not based on human merit, okay? There's enough scripture to support that. You don't need a whole lot of verses to support that. There's an abundance of verses that support that fact. And the immediate context is salvation. That is deliverance from law. And a, a healthy fear involves humility. A, a healthy recognition of weakness in ourselves. Okay? Weakness in ourselves. Uh, but we're not being in, we're not inadequate. We're not without sufficient resources in Christ. We are without sufficient resources in ourselves, but we're not without sufficient resources in Christ. Please, please understand that before we go any further. Phobos, to flee, withdraw, okay? Properly that word, phobos, okay? Just all of you people out there that love to look into the, to the history, the, the, the contextual, uh, the, the commentaries on this, you'll find out that phobos, the word, means, it means to flee or withdraw. And from about 900 BC on, that's, that's been quite a while ago, it meant a withdrawal, a fleeing away from feelings of being inadequate or being without sufficient resources. Okay, that is how the word was defined by this fellow Homer, who was a, you can Google the guy, he was an expert in ancient Greek, a late 8th or, or early 7th century B.C. Those are the feelings that we withdraw from. That is what we fear. We fear such feelings as that. Fearing here means to flee from feelings of being inadequate or being without sufficient resources because we are not without re sufficient resources in Christ. Okay? Uh, Second Corinthians, I believe. Second Corinthians... Uh, hmm find this first and I'll get back to you here okay second Corinthians 3 4 and 6 and such trust we have through Christ to God word to God word not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves but our sufficiency is of God who has also made us able ministers of the New Testament not of the letter but of the spirit for the letter that is law killeth but the spirit gives life fear here folks is fleeing from feelings of not having sufficient resources because i am not without sufficient resources in christ I am without sufficient resources in myself. And the context is, interestingly, salvation and deliverance. Okay? Our text begins, if we pick up where we left off, wherefore or therefore, I'm not sure how it reads in your, in your translation there. Therefore, since Jesus Christ is Lord, since Jesus Christ is Lord, verse 11, Lord, the word the Lord there, Kyrios, it, it's, it basically means a person exercising absolute ownership rights. Okay? So, therefore, verse 12 and 13 makes a ton of sense. God owns us. And beloved, therefore, beloved. Well, well interesting. And, it's, it, and I, I'm, I'm amazed at how we tend to gloss over such words as that therefore beloved and we just go on reading and we don't even think about the beloved <laughs> dearly beloved he's calling us beloved god loves us okay just as, as you have always obeyed and there's where we get into a a real sticky sort of a mess if we don't if we don't uh, if we're not really careful as we've always obeyed. Well, of course, we know that means keeping the law. 
It's not, not even what the word means, folks. The word means obey means to hear. Okay? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you. Most of you Greek students are, are out there, you're well aware of the fact that hupakuo in the Greek, the word obey, hupakuo, is an intensification of the simple verb akuo, which means to listen, to hear. Faith comes through hearing akuo, okay? And obey is hupakuo. It's it's the the hupo part is the word is under. It's under hearing. You're under the hearing of another. It's the the word hupakuo or obey is a word that intensifies the normal word hear, such as we we see in in faith comes through hearing. Okay, faith comes through akuo. Faith comes through akuo. And Paul is saying here, okay, as you have always really accoued, really, really obeyed, really heard, okay, really heard. It, it is an, in, I hope I'm making sense here. It is the intensification, the intense form of the word here. That's what it means. That's what, it doesn't mean do. There's another word in the, in the Greek New Testament. It's, it's a word you see all through the New Testament. It's a word, uh, it's the word for do, okay? And it's the word, the word is poieo. It's where we, we've taken our word poet from it, meaning to create, okay? Poieo means to do, okay? That's not, that's not the, uh, synonymous with the word obey, hupakuo, okay? The word that obey and do are not synonymous is what I'm trying to say, Okay? just as you've always obeyed says paul okay beloved god loves us and just as you've always heard just as you've always been under the hearing and we know that his sheep hear his voice we hear because we are his sheep just as you have always obeyed just as you have always heard and i mean really heard it's, it's the intensification of the simple verb to listen. I mean, Abraham obeyed, hupakuo, and he went. Okay? Not as in my presence only, he says, but now much more in my absence. And folks, I... I am absolutely all in favor of scriptural reading, okay? Reading scripture, okay? We, we need to read the Bible, okay? But we're to study to show ourselves approved. And you know the rest of the verse. Reading is fine, okay? But we need to study. You, we can read scripture. We can read these words, okay? And... Uh, and not understand what we're what we're what we're reading. Uh, I can spend a whole lot more t much more time on on the word fear, phobos. But we're, let's look at trembling, trembling, tremor. Uh, there's five occurrences of the word. Okay. Uh, there's one in the Gospels, only one, and the other four are in Paul's epistles. And none of these were where we find the words uh, fear and trembling. None of them, none of them are negative. Okay? If you don't get anything else out of this video but, but this, I, you'd be doing well. One, God does not spook his children to do anything he does he's not a spook he, he doesn't frighten he doesn't scare he doesn't terrify his children especially when it comes to do anything okay he's not someone he's not this guy that we fear and dread in the sense that we commonly use the term fear like i would use it in in the context of running into a bear in the woods okay is what I'm trying to tell you. That's not what our text is saying. 
God doesn't frighten His children to do anything. It's used of the women who ran out of the, t of the empty tomb back in Mark chapter 16. You have these two women coming to the tomb. You know, everybody's familiar with, with the passage. They, they, they see the angel. The angel tells them that uh, Christ is risen, that uh, he's to meet them in Galilee. He's going to go up before them, uh, before the disciples. He's going to go ahead of them. But the women are to go and tell the disciples that he's to be uh, uh, met in Galilee. And uh, the women run out of the tomb, and they are in awe. They're in reverence. They're in astonishment. And, and you've got to ask yourself, if you, it would be, I, I think it'd be a good thing to stop there and ask yourself a few questions instead of just going on. Okay, this is, this is quite a remarkable event here. Okay, he's gone. He's risen. The women run out of the tomb. Are they afraid of, in the, in the sense of, of, do they, are they, are they fearing God in the sense of, well, you know, of punishment? Uh, in the sense of, the, of, I think maybe you understand what I might be getting at here. They run out of the tomb. There's no fear of danger. There's just a feeling of reverence, of astonishment. The, the text makes it clear. Amazement. Are they, are, if you take that definition, are they fleeing from feelings of being inadequate or being without sufficient resources? You could say that. Because they were not without sufficient resources in Christ. It's used of Paul, and I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. Okay? Could that be a feeling of... Uh, of fleeing from feelings of being inadequate or being, Paul is saying, I, I am fleeing from any feelings that I might have of being inadequate or being without sufficient resources. When I know that I have those resources uh, in Christ, I'm not without those resources in Christ. Uh, I'm, I'm without su sufficient resources in and of myself, but not in Christ. And that's how I stood before you. I was with you in that. I was with you in fear and in trembling makes sense to me uh, you do what you want with the passage but it, it makes all the sense in the world to me how about the way that the corinthians received titus okay in the, the seventh chapter of second corinthians and his inward affection is more abundant towards you while he remembers the obedience of you all the hearing of you all how with fear and trembling ye received him. Okay, so they had fear and trembling when it came to receiving Titus. Okay. Could that be? A fleeing from feelings of being inadequate or being... These people there, at, these, these believers there at Corinth, they, they, they had... They were fleeing from any feelings of being inadequate or being without sufficient resources because they were not without sufficient resources in Christ to receive Titus. Makes sense to me. And then there's, there's the slaves toward their masters. Today we would, we would look at that as, as a, uh, an employee-employer relationship. Uh, it's in Ephesians chapter 6. Servants... Be obedient. Oh, it's interesting, this obedient. And this is what I, what's I found amazing. It seems like every, every, when you look at the other occurrences of fear and trembling, what you'll find out is you'll find out that word obedience is right there alongside the context somewhere. It's within close proximity of that verse, if not within the verb, the very verse itself. The, the idea of our, of our obedience being hearing uh, the intense, the intensification of the word here, obey. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling. Well, are, are you supposed to, you know, if I have a boss and I'm working for my, my employer and and uh, am I supposed to fear him in the sense of the, that I would fear the grizzly bear uh, that I ran into walking through the woods? Or is it something else? It says, in singleness of your heart, as unto Christ. Okay? 
of fleeing from feelings of being inadequate or being without sufficient resources, says Homer from 900 BC on. That's what the word meant. And so we see this in, the, in, the, in our present context of Philippians 2.12, of believers working out their salvation with fear and trembling. I'm going to suggest, folks, that for us to work out our deliverance from law is that we do that through by fleeing away from, withdrawing from, from feelings of being inadequate or being without sufficient resources because we, we are not without sufficient resources in Christ. That's what I'm going to suggest, okay? Just as you've always heard, just as you've always really heard, We're to work out our salvation with fear and trembling because it is God at work in us, both the will and do of his good pleasure. That that is a constant, that that's all inclusive, that that means that, that he has he worked in your life according to his good will and pleasure from, well, before, before you even knew that he was doing it. He's always done that. He's never done anything but that. It's not... Folks, it's not the, the, the typical narrative that, that you would expect to hear in, in, around, around the world uh, on a Sunday morning or a Wednesday night you know, or a Sunday night service. It's not the typical message that Christians are being fed, okay? Uh, I, I don't know. If, if even if I've ever really, I can't think back in 35 years or more, have I ever, have I ever really looked seriously at those words, fear and trembling, or did I just go along assuming that, well, it, I, I I knew it. It didn't mean that we dreaded God, that He was, that we feared Him like some slave driver God, some. Some angry, you know, we slip up, he gets angry at us. And, you know, I knew, I knew it wasn't that, but I, but I still didn't really understand myself what, what it meant to work out my salvation with fear and trembling. And the reason why I'm doing that is because it is, it is God at work in me, both the will and do of his good pleasure. If you take the definition of the words fear and trembling and you look at them in context, which will change the meaning of, of how you, or it won't change the definition of the word fear and trembling. But, but the context makes it clear, I think, what he's talking about. It is because we are his that God has always worked in us powerfully and effectively, carrying on his work through all of our ignorance, all of our blindness, through all difficulties, all obstacles, all circumstances, including so-called failures, and I'll put those in quotes, uh, I don't think from God's perspective anything is a failure in your life. That, it, that would seem to contradict the very uh, words that we're reading here. That, that, yes, that, that would include times of rebellion, times of unfaithfulness he's doing that with in absolute certainty until the which time that this work be complete which it he it will be he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of christ jesus he's never ceased working in you to both will and do of his good pleasure because that is his purpose okay and it's and it's because He's doing that, that we are to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. He, he does this with, a, with an end goal in mind, okay? Quite well aware. He's well aware of the fact, folks, that as he continues this divine work in you, that you'll often go against his will and better judgment. But he, it's still, he still continues to, to work. Philippians 1 6, it does, it does not say he who began a good work in you might complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. If only you'd let him. It doesn't say that. What it says, what Paul says is, but being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work, 
singular in you, singular work, will complete it, not might, but will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. What is the day of Christ Jesus? The end of this age. And yet every commentator, every single one that I've read on this forces human merit into the passage that we're looking at. Everyone. And I, I'm not going to do that. I can't do that. I'm seeing just the opposite. Now, that may alarm you. That may shock some of you. But I, I, I don't see that. Okay. I see no human merit whatsoever in our working out our salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God at work in you both the will and do of his good pleasure. I do not see fear and trembling as anything negative. I see it as, as absolutely something that we can do. In fact, I see it as something that we probably do do. We work out our salvation with fear. That is... And as I said, when you look at all of these references and you look at, 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 at how the word was used from 900 B.C. on up to the present time, that's, what is that, two, or 3,010 years? Uh, it's a long time, okay? Every commentator I read forced, try to, try to, tries to force human merit into this, you know? God's not going to work, you know, in our lives according to His good will and pleasure. If and unless we we fall in line and we do something, we unless unless we're doing what we should be doing, God's not going to be doing what it says that He's doing. And that's not what I read in the text at all. Not at all. This verse doesn't scare me in the in the, in the least. It comforts me. Because it, what it's telling me is, it, is it's telling me that as I am working out my deliverance from law, okay, with, with the understanding that, that, that with, with the thought in mind that I'm, what I'm fleeing and, or withdrawing from are those feelings of, of in it, the, the feelings that I am inadequate somehow. Because I know that my, my, my adequacy is is Christ. It is Christ. For me to live is Christ. I don't know how much sense I'm making here, folks. I hope that, that maybe at least you can understand at least a little bit of, of where my position is on this. Uh, it, it, you will have to work through this, this, uh, this text for yourself. Okay? Uh, I highly suggest you spend time in it that you spend time looking, cross-referencing, and looking at these other verses where that the words fear and trembling appear or occur. I don't know, over the, the, my, the span of time that I've been a Christian, I don't know how many times I've heard people say that God does not, He never overrides the will of the creature. And folks, that is a lie. That he, that he does exactly that is the consistent theme of Scripture. Just you, you pick a person, okay? I don't care. Pick Joseph, Abraham, Paul. I mean, pick anyone, okay? This is what he's done. How about an absolute belief that God is constantly, constantly working behind the scenes in every single, every, every area of our lives, even when there's no tangible evidence in, in to, to confirm that fact, even if there's no evidence to really support that fact. Faith is described in Hebrews 11, you know, as being certain of what we do not see. Once, once this unbelief gets gains the upper hand in our in our life, it, fear 
just takes hold of our emotions. It's, but it's the wrong kind of fear. Okay? If faith is, is the bedrock foundation, okay, of, of our walk, then I don't hardly see how that we can, that, that fear can take hold of our emotions in the sense that we commonly use the word fear. Our deliverance from fear and worry is based on faith, which is the very opposite of unbelief. We, we need to understand that faith is not something that we can produce, that we muster up on our own. That's another lie, okay? Oh, uh, you just need to have, you know, I tell my brother out there, oh, you just need to have more faith. You know, if, first of all, if, if he needed to have more faith, he'd have it. No, I'm going to, that's, I'm going to tell you straight up. If, if that brother needed to have more faith, God would have given it to him, but he didn't. Who are we to suggest that he need, and who are we to suggest that, that he needs to leave this area in which he's at? And I don't, I'm not talking about a phys, actual physical location, but just, but stop being involved in what you're being involved in and be involved in this, this other thing. And if you do that, then everything will be fine. Uh, it's not my job to tell that brother or that sister in Christ what I think they ought to be doing in their life. That's law. I'm not going to move them away from a place that God is working at in, in their lives. God may be, God may be, he may, it may very well be his will and purpose for them to be going through something in their lives in which it's, it's is for their benefit. And I certainly don't want to take and move them away from that. I can't play God in, like that in their life. I don't want to do, play God like that in their life. We know faith's a gift. And faithfulness is described as a, as a fruit or, or a characteristic that's produced in our lives by the Holy Spirit. It's a confident assurance in a God who loves us, who knows our thoughts, who cares about our deepest needs. And that faith continues to grow as we study this book and, and, and just grow in grace and knowledge of Him. Since beginning this study, we saw, uh, I've pointed out to you that it's the Holy Spirit is the author, not Paul. We're not looking at his logic, okay, his reasoning, but it's this, this is God's love letter to us. And it's, I'm not taking away from Paul's feelings toward the Philippians. Paul loved the Philippians. He, he had feelings toward these believers as we, as we, we, do, we would, okay. And that these are God's feelings toward us. The same feelings that Paul shows toward the Philippians are God's feelings toward us. We looked at, we looked at, we at least touched on who Paul was. You know, Pharisee of Pharisees. At where Paul was in, in, the, in, the, in the, probably a dark dungeon of a prison, that he was a bond slave. Not in the sense, not, not as much in the physical sense, but he was a bond slave to Christ. Okay? He couldn't have done anything else other than what he was doing. That he's the prototype of all of, of us who believe that, that trials advance the gospel. We don't want trials, so I guess we don't want the gospel to advance. We see their, we see their fellowship in the gospel. We see God's work in us. We see the bond between believers. We see that we're to be sincere and without offense blameless not offending how do we do that do you want to offend a brother okay put him under law do you want do you want to cause offense and do you want to to be uh you will let me let me don't don't get confused. You will always stand before God, holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. But you can live your life in a way that is not consistent with that. Okay. I think the only time that we offend God is we take away from the person and the work of Christ in our life. That we make less of that. That's causing that's causing an offense. 
Okay? You don't cause an offense. You, know, you don't offend God by, by failing to live all, you know, live up to the law. Okay. I think you I think we offend God by not maintaining the fact that we've died to the law without living under the the understanding, the realization of the fact daily, reckoning ourselves to be dead to sin, but alive unto God in Christ. That we've died to sin, we've died to the law, we've died to the world, we've died to self, we've died to Satan, we've died to, to death, okay? We've been co -crucif been crucified with Christ, identified with Him in His death, burial, and resurrection. And, and if we don't understand that, that, that we don't serve out of the flesh, that we serve out of the Spirit, the flesh being law, if we don't understand that, then we are causing offense, okay? And we're actually causing harm to our fellow fellow brethren. We've seen that God longs to be with us in, in, in this, and we've seen that for us to live is Christ. It's we've seen it's needful for us to be here, or we wouldn't be here. We looked at the the gospel and, and how that the, our enemies by preaching the, the, just the very message of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Uh, creates adversity. They'll hate us. Just as they hated him, they'll hate us. We're looking here at, at in, in, in this particular context, we're looking at this bond between believers. We're looking at Christ suffering for our sake. We're looking at us suffering for Christ's sake. Filling up that which is lacking. Death in us, but life in you. It's isn't it remarkable, folks? How that, that that we were the fruit that came forth from Christ's death. Death in in Him. The death of Christ brought us into life. We were we came out of of that. Uh, the same is true. Is it is it all that difficult to believe that? Our death to self, our dying daily. It's death works in us, but life in you. It's the same principle. That, I'm trying to say that the, the same principle that worked in Christ, that was uh, working in Christ, life out of death, okay? That life precedes, actually life precedes any action on our part. It's we, but, but the... Uh, it's, it's always life comes first before, you know, something has to be created before it can respond, uh, before it can do anything. But what's remarkable about, about this whole identification, our, our identification with Christ in His death, burial, and resurrection, what is so remarkable about that is, is, how, is how closely we've been so identified with Christ. Okay? It's... The exaltation of Christ. And, and what we're looking at right here is the sovereignty. This in verse 12 and 13. We're looking at the sovereignty of God in, in, in our deliverance from law. That's what we're looking at. Okay? And that is what we're to work out. We're to work out that deliverance from law with fear and trembling. Because it is God at work in us both the will and do of His good pleasure. He will do that. The, the text isn't, this, this, is not a, this is not a condition. There's no conditional clause here, okay? God is working in us both the will and do of His good pleasure. Whether you know it or not, whether you like it or not, that's what He's doing. So what are, what are we to do? We, we are to work out our own deliverance from law with fear and trembling. What would cause us not to fear and tremble? Uh, it's The text makes it clear that we want to be fearing and trembling here, right here, okay? In this present context. When Jesus told His disciples, fear not, do not fear, don't be afraid, 
I don't have any problem with that. I don't see any contradiction here is what I'm trying to say. It's here we're looking at the word phobos, fear, and the and the in the Greek word for tremor, okay. In the context of deliverance from law. Deliverance, not redemption, but deliverance. And we're we're to it's it's a good thing. We need to ha to have this, the right fear and trembling. We need to understand what fear and trembling is. Maybe I can simplify it by simply saying what I believe is true of me of myself. And I, I I'm not asking anybody to agree with me, but where I presently stand in my relationship with the Lord, I know that I am working out my deliverance from law because I'm not under law. I'm under grace. I am working out my own deliverance from law with the, with the realization that I am not without adequate resources in Christ. I am without sufficient resources in myself, okay, but not in Christ. Dearly beloved, rest in him. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.